Well, hey there, everybody. Greetings and salutations, and welcome to the Friends Sharing Pictures with Each Other show. I am, of course, your host, John Campia, and no, I will not tell you what that means. Uh, <laughs> joining me in the uh, for open mic here today, we got Ray Ora, who also does not know what we what what we're talking about. Uh, Jonathan Voico, who also I, does not know what we're usually, talking. Usually, that usually I don't know. What we're no talking idea. About. No idea. Completely. No. No idea. Just ignore everything I said. Good to have you guys here for open mic, the show where the mic is open, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. What do you guys want to talk about? That is what we are going to discuss here today. So if you've got a topic or a question for the show, there's two ways you can send them in to be addressed. The first way is if you're not watching the show live, you know, one of the other 23 hours during the day, you can use, you can see it right here, our tip link at www.streamelements.com slash John Campia slash tip. You can send in a topic or question there. Or if you are watching live right now, you can use the super chat feature in the live chat there, send that in. And if any of your topics or questions well, are appropriate to be addressed on our show. We will address them here on Open Mic. Now, before we get into uh, your questions and topics, got to at least address this. So earlier today, we talked about the fact that um, Flash crossed a major box office milestone. It crossed the hundred million dollar domestic mark in just three weeks. Three weeks. A number that, of course, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse made in like three days. Oh. <laughs> it made $120 <laughs> million in three days. Whereas, uh, yeah, Flash has taken three weeks to make $100 million yeah. domestic. And now listen, lest you forget or lest you believe that I am some sort of Flash movie hater, I love this movie. Yeah, this movie's good. I, I loved it. I think it's great. But just because I think it's a great movie does not mean it has been anything short of a monumental box office failure. As a matter of fact, a lot of the outlets now today are writing that it's, they claim official that the flash is now the biggest box office money loser of all time in the comic book movie genre. Aww. They're estimating it's lost around $200 million. Most movies don't cost $200 million to make, let alone be positioned to lose $200 million. So we've got uh, an issue now of we're going to be dissecting and I think looking at why. What was the reason for this movie flopping the way it's flopped and all that kind of stuff? I mean, it wasn't from quality. It's a, it's a great movie. Uh, not everybody thought it was a great movie, but that's the subjective nature of film. The majority of people thought it was a great movie. Uh, I mean, a, there's a good chunk of it has to do with you know, obviously all the Ezra controversy and the idiocy that Ezra Miller's exhibit over the last couple of years. There's that. I personally think the bigger thing is just that the DCEU brand has been in the toilet for a long, long time. Is there another one? No, no. I, w I just wanted to ask, do you, do you remember when it was first announced to, to be released? Like, do you remember that first date before they started moving it? Was, what was the year like 2000, I think they, the original, I believe that the original release date, because they announced the movie in 2014. Right. The original release date, I believe, was 2018. So five years ago was when the movie was originally supposed to come out. So I'm starting to think it, was, it came out late then. <laughs> maybe, late. maybe a little bit because, late. You know, if coming off the heels of whatever happened with the Justice League, Zack Snyder, and things It like would have been closer to around the time of the first Aquaman movie. Yeah, yeah. So that. Yeah, because I don't know. I, I don't know. But, but let, me, let me address something here quick, okay? Because I've still seen some people today going around with this absolutely ridiculous notion that anything uh, with the, the flopping of Flash had to do with, well, they announced that they're rebooting the universe. That's why this movie failed. They, this movie failed. People weren't interested because they announced they're rebooting the DCU. Why should anybody go see it? They're rebooting. Okay. I just need to, to point this out. If you have a second, Jonathan, to bring my screen up on screen, uh, try refreshing it because that's uh, that's not what's up on my screen. That's the Flash's box office, by the way. $101 million domestically. Uh, okay, I'll try that again Can I here. do some breaking news then while we're doing, doing Yeah, can, can you do it? Can you do the breaking news? Uh, yeah, this? Right, there we go. All okay, right. Okay. I want to point out these long list of box office failures for – the DCEU, all right? Black Adam, Shazam, Birds of Prey, Wonder Woman, Suicide Squad. 
Shazam Fury of the Gods, we'll set that aside for a second. So don't count Shazam Fury of the Gods here, and I'll tell you why we're not going to count a second. All of these movies flopped and failed before they ever announced there was going to be a reboot of the DCEU. Don't act surprised when the next movie of the DCU flops and go, oh, it must be because they announced a reboot. As if all the previous six movies that came out were big blockbuster hits. They all failed. Black, remember Black Adam? Not only did they now announce a reboot, they're telling you, Henry Cavill's back as Superman, everybody. Woo! And you know, nobody got more excited about that than me. Right? Yep. So oh, that was that was before they announced the reboot. Dwayne the Rock Johnson, Henry Cavill's back as Superman. Woo! Doesn't even make four hundred million dollars. A movie fifteen years in the making with the biggest movie star in the world, and they announced Henry Cavill's coming back and all this kind of stuff. That movie didn't make four hundred million dollars. Birds of Prey barely cracked two hundred million dollars. Now, granted, there are some asterisks that need to go on with Wonder Woman and Suicide Squad with some extenuating circumstances, but even still, 169 million, 168 million. This was all before they announced that there was a reboot, guys. Let's not pretend that, oh, that must be why the next movie flopped. It, it's not, okay? The pattern has been going on for five years. This is a five-year pattern going all the way back to the first Aquaman. When that one was a big breakout hit, the one true, true hit of the DCEU, it was like in 2018. Let's not pretend that, oh, uh, they're announcing Ruby. That's that's why Flash failed. No, this has been a pattern for years. That's why it failed. I don't know. What do you think? Do you do you think the Batman and and the Joker movie, the else or else world, or do you think those? Got people to say, you know what? I prefer these movies. Yes. I don't want these movies yeah. anymore. And they're just skipping them. Yeah, I, and look, here's the irony. The irony is, I remember when they announced the Joker movie, and I was super excited that they were finally doing an Elseworlds thing, something not connected to the cinematic universe, right? Here's the irony. The irony was, when they announced that there was this Joker movie, but it was in no way tied to what was going on in the, in the current DCEU, right? And everybody said, no one's going to go see this movie if it doesn't have Batman and it's just going to confuse everybody. No one's going to be interested in it, blah, blah, blah. What happened? That's the movie that got a Best Picture nomination. That's the movie that crossed a billion dollar mark. And then The Batman with Robert Pattinson. You know, uh, you know, there's already a Batman. There's already, guess what? Those two, and that one made over $700 million. So the movies that were not connected to the DCEU they could still be successful, which tells us that the brands, the brand, the individual character brands that DC holds can still hold great value. It's just that the DCEU, which has always misfired, even when I, and I've loved most of the movies, but right from Man of Steel, which I believe is the most criminally underrated comic book film in the history of comic book films. But right from Man of Steel, half the audience was against it. Like, uh, to this day, whenever I talk about the greatness of Man of Steel, I get people yelling at me, Man of Steel sucks! Which, again, is totally fair. Movies are subjective. If you think it sucks, that's fine. We're can st we can still be friends. But, I mean, it's just been... It just makes me chuckle when I see some people scrambling to come up with some excuse as to why this newest DCEU movie didn't work and say, well, it must be because... Six weeks ago, they announced a reboot or two months, whatever. That, that's why this one failed. Really? So, so all, the, all these other ones, all these other ones, it, it, they just failed for weird, who knows, coincidental. No, no, no. This has been a longstanding pattern. And it, it just, whether or not they announced a reboot, if they, announced, if they didn't announce the DCU reboot until next month, Flash still would have failed. Yep. I mean, I mean that. Sorry, guys. It's five years of patterns, going all the way back to groundwork that was laid ten years ago when Man of Steel came out. They needed to reboot. They needed to announce a reboot to get some excitement going for what's coming up in 2025. But, um, and, and again, the whole Ezra Miller situation certainly did not help. I think that had a bigger impact than most people think. Now, I never thought that The Flash was going to be a billion-dollar movie, 
But it could have been bigger than this. I yeah. think if they had been able to avoid a lot of that nonsense. Especially but. if the, it released in between when we were first introduced to him, somewhere in between mm -hmm. then and the next Justice League or whatever. Like Batman versus Superman was pretty much a mini Justice League movie, right? With uh, Sort of in a way, and I guess. towards yeah. the end, you know what I mean? So somewhere after they introduced him in that movie, maybe somewhere before then it would have worked, but it, it just came out too late. Everyone's already uh, left the train station. Yeah, no, no. yeah, nobody like everybody's given up. Like, got, nobody watches DCU movies anymore. I got two things of breaking news. If 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 you, oh, what do you got? Okay, no boy. Is this a? Oh my God! Here no, we no, go. no, no. Pizza <laughs> Hut right now. They have brought back the big New Yorker, right? Uh, I don't know get, what that is. You but get it? Sounds good. Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem box with it. It's cool. I mean, I think it's cool. The other thing is, I just saw a little leak that AMC theaters is going to have green icy when the movie comes out and it's going to have like little things in there. So that's my well, two breaking news. For if the AMC Man. does like a, uh, a Ninja Turtles popcorn thing, would you get one? I'm not sure about, cause those are expensive. I'll get the icy cause it has like little turtles. The in icy you'll get without that. No, no, no. Because you don't have to get a free cup with that. It's just, you buy I love icy. Pizza but, Hut is doing a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is our breaking news of the day. I love that. Yeah. It's open mic, man. That's my it's breaking open news. Mic. It's important to me. I there's one person, please, it's that's watching mic. that that's important to too, please. I don't know how he hit the algos because our concurrent viewers just like tripled after you mentioned as that. As soon as you mentioned the big New Yorker. Hey, listen, I'll tell you what. Uh <laughs> Anne's excited about it too. Oh, and I saw a clip where they invaded a news, a news segment. They're doing the weather and the mutant mayhem turtles came in and said we're here, whatever. What was it? What was it like? Dudes in costumes, or yeah, was yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, but I'm telling you, this promotion is uh, ramping up right now. So. I know Ray got so excited when we were in Vegas, and uh, we were staying at Caesar's Palace. So there's all these statues all over yeah, Caesar's naked Palace, right? With the penises and, stuff. and all. Look, <laughs> because that's Caesar's Palace. It's all penis and like whatever. Penises flat, and stuff. Flat, flat fronts. If that's the what you get. You get the little baby woolly mammoth and the, penises and stuff in the flat fronts. So, so a lot um, of statues, nonetheless. And Ray got all excited because well, not, not for because that of the penises, oh, but yeah, because yeah. of all the statues had the teenage mutant ninja turtle eye band masks on. Not only that, they actually had their skateboards too. They're holding skateboards. They, that's right, they did. They did have the skateboards. Come on, See, huh? look at that promotion right look there. Look at that promotion right for there. A shit movie, watch. <laughs> All right, <laughs> guys, with all that down, let's get to why we are here, which is to take your topics and questions here, shall we? So let's get things started here with the tippling questions. Jonathan, what do we got? Okay, Garden Variety Vagabond writes, Allison Mack of Smallville was just released early from her three-year sentence for her part in recruiting women for the mm. Nexium sex cult. Uh, would you feel awkward watching her in a show in the future, or should she retire? Your thoughts? I, I'm not trying, in all seriousness, I'm not trying to be facetious. I don't know how you come back from something like that. I mean, no comeback story for her. Uh, uh, I just, yeah, I just don't think that will work. With her. <laughs> I get it. Uh, well, no, I didn't. I just have to be a Parks and Rec question. fan to get that. No, no comeback story for that. <laughs> but uh, I, I just, it's look again. As some people have pointed out, it's not like she murdered anybody. I, yeah. I, I get it, but, but something like that is very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. I think for her to come back from. Would I feel awkward seeing her? Again, she never murdered anybody, stuff like that. I don't know, maybe after a few years, I'd be, oh, that's the girl who played, uh, who played what's her name Chloe. in Smallville? Chloe, Chloe in yeah. Smallville. I, I don't know, maybe, but it's, yeah, that's a tough one to come back. I, I remember watching Michael Rosenbaum talk about how I think Allison Mack tried to uh, recruit him into this Nexium sex club. Now, hey, listen, somebody comes up to me on the street and says, would you like to hear about our sex club? I, I might be receptive a little bit, but <laughs> I'm just saying it, this one, this is going like to be tough to come back from. It's going to be tough. It's a tough one for her to come back from. I, I don't think I, I think I think it would be more awkward for her, to be honest, like knowing everyone knows what. All well, that of course. Is. So I, I mean, yes, I, I mean, yes, I would not want to be her right now, um, but it's it's uh, again, I don't want to blow it out of proportion. It's not like she murdered anybody. But this is going to be a tough one to come back from. All right, what's next? Uh, Sam Fisher writes, something to put on your radar. On August 9th, Apple is releasing Strange Planet, an animated series based on the NYT, I'm guessing New York Times, best-selling graphic novel and viral phenomenon of the same name from original creator Nathan Pyle and Dan Harmon. 
Uh, I'm so excited for the series. Yeah, it's uh, an adult. They're referring, of course, with Dan Harmon attached to it. It's an adult animated series. I know nothing about it. I don't know anything about the original source material. Obviously, I mean, I like a lot of Dan Harmon stuff, so I I pay a little bit of attention to what he's going on. But I, other than that, I really don't know much about it. Is that the Rick and Morty guy? Yeah, he also was the community guy. and Yeah, so... uh, an adult animated thing. I mean, that seems to be all the rage now. I remember when like the heavier skewing adult com like animated stuff was coming out. That was kind of novel. Now it's like all over the place. Some do it well. Some don't. Some don't do it so well. But I'll I'll at least check it out. I'll give it a shot. All right. What's next? Uh, Jared Overfield writes. I will admit uh, that I have never seen the Prestige, but that ends tonight. I am returning to Atlanta Plaza Theater where Room of Palooza was to see it on actual thirty five millimeter. If oh, wow. Yeah, if R&B lived here, I would drag him with me. Physical media for life. <laughs> yeah, the Prestige. I have a I have a really odd relationship with the Prestige. Of course, it's a Christopher Nolan film. For the most part, it's a great film. I just really don't like the ending. Like that- the movie itself is so good for ninety five percent of the way through the movie. Like it's got me the the twists, the turns, the intrigue, the mystery, the characters, the conflict. I love this movie. If I can watch it and then about 10 minutes for the end, just turn turn it off and go, well, that was good. And then walk away because I really don't let the more the more time that passes, the less and less I like the ending of that movie. I think oh. it's a really terrible ending wow. and it, it almost ruins the rest of the movie. It doesn't ruin the rest of the movie. The rest of the movie is still brilliant and great. I just never big on the, the ending. of it. So my advice to you, find out when the movie ends. Look at your watch and about... Seven minutes before the movie ends, walk out and go, that was a great movie, and and enjoy yourself. All right, what's next? Uh, we've got JCSC who writes, over under 30% that both Oppenheimer and Barbie make over $50 million on opening weekend. Barbie is projected to exceed that, and, and $50 million is on the upper end for Oppenheimer. Easy. I'm quite curious because there are a lot of factors that could sway either way. I think they overperform. Easy. Barbie could come in over 80 I mean, they're projecting the high end for Barbie to be 75, 70, 75. I think it could hit 80. But, I mean, I we'll see. We'll see. Oppenheimer, I could see it hitting 50. So what was the over-under? 30. 30. I, I would take the over yeah. on both of them making 50. Yeah, I go over too. Now, if you say both of them making 60, that, that becomes more more tricky. Easy. Easy. You think, you want how much do you think Oppenheimer's going to make opening weekend? Easy work. That's it, 60, but that I'm not going any more than that. So you think you get it 60 opening weekend? Yeah, yeah. Because right now the projections are saying the upper end is 50. Easy. All right. It's easy, baby. I remember Christopher Nolan movies, they they traditionally have really good legs. They don't necessarily make all their money up front. So, okay, but you're going to go 60. I mean, we've been to some theaters on opening night. Man, it's packed. If that movie is like, if people are talking, people are going to watch it before the end of the weekend. But they got to see it on the weekend to talk about it for people to come back later. I mean... Just, just, just let me have my prediction. You got it. You got you it. You know, if I'm putting one thousand dollars on red, you don't go, man. You're gonna lose all that money. You could buy. It. I wouldn't just do let that. Me do it. I would pat you on the back and say, "Go, Ray, go." <laughs> Always bet on bet on black. That's what I've learned from. That's what Wesley Snipes. T- if Wesley Snipes has taught Always us anything. Black. It is always bet on black. Yeah. Just don't stop me from. I just won't my stop life. you. <laughs> all right. What's next? <laughs> okay. Uh, Chris Miner writes. Whoop. Still on tips. Anonymous writes. Are there many instances of an actor's salary exceeding that of the director? All the time. Yeah. It's All the often, time. Yeah. It's often said that the actors spend the least time on a project and reading about some earnings. It's not, or it's hard not to look at it as disproportionate in some cases. It is rare when the, I mean, unless you're talking about smaller movies, right. but for the, for most general Hollywood films, it is rare that the director's salary will be higher than any of the actors. Unless their name is, ends in Nolan uh, and possibly Spielberg. Mm-hmm. Uh, that it's just it's just the case. Yeah, I mean, I'd I'd venture to say even Scorsese that that is not the case. That DiCaprio. That one he's working with more. DiCaprio. Yeah, <laughs> like it, it's and it, there's there is I get it. It's understandable because the actor is the face that the audience sees, but the actor in a movie is one tenth as important as who's directing it. Let me. Say, I'm not, and I'm not being exact. I'm not being facetious here, and I'm not trying to exaggerate the actor is about one tenth of as important to a movie as the person directing the movie is the person directing the movie is on that movie for years 
the person directing that movie makes all the decisions. But everything from the way a certain corner is lit. Yes, they have other, they have cinematographers that will do that too, but they've got to review and approve or make changes to anything. Every costuming decision, every set location, every actor brought in, all the way the story flows, all that kind of stuff. In a fair world, the director makes the most money on a movie, notwithstanding the people who pay for the movie, but for all everybody employed to make a movie, the director is the most important person and therefore should be the one making the most money. But... That's not the reality we live in. The reality we live in is that, well, the actor's face is the one that people see. The people don't see the director's face. And so there's value attached to that. But yeah, it is rare that a director makes more than the, than the actors do. All right, what's next? All right, Hugo, Hugo Heilinger writes, Tom Cruise is really one of the last actors of a dying breed right now that can do what he can do. It depends on what you mean by do what he can do. If you're talking about doing all the action stuff, I mean... I mean, there are other actors who could do it, just don't have the craziness that he has to yeah. do it. And by the way, for those watching who may say be under, you know, might be 25 or under, Tom Cruise ain't got nothing on Jackie Chan. Yeah. Like, there, there's a little viral video going around right now of Jack. There's actually, have you guys seen this? Yeah. Of Jackie I can't, Chan I, I, with his daughter. Yeah. Watching a highlight reel of some of his crazier stunts. And him crying and stuff like that. But but in all seriousness, you want to go back. Like Tom, look, Tom Cruise is certified nutball. What oh. he does, he is crazy the stuff he does. But he ain't got nothing on Jackie Chan. <laughs> my my <clears throat> what? My fingers just got trembly and numb. Just thinking about the stunts I watched a long time ago of Jackie Chan, like the edge of the building stuff. Come on, man. That stuff. Ugh. I'm no, like the stuff he would do is crazy. And then Jackie Chan had one guy come along that kind of looked like he would become Jackie Chan's heir apparent. And he never broke out like Jackie Chan does, but some of you might recognize his name. His name is Tony Jaw. Uh, Tony Jaw was another guy who came out of nowhere and did all of his own stunts and did some absolutely nutty, crazy stuff. That He broke out, the one he broke out this movie called Ong Back. And if you want to see, it's a terrible movie, but if you <laughs> want to see a crazy martial arts action with some dude doing the craziest things, uh, look up the movie Ong Back, and, and it's just, just crazy. All right, what's next? Okay, we've got Vanessa Starker who writes, Hey, crew, not a TV... Not a movie TV related thing, but today I was golfing, made my first hole in one on a par three, wow. from 186 out with my seven iron. It was so cool. Just wanted to share my experience. I made my first hole in one when I was 13 years old. Now, granted, it was a mini golf course, but I'm not going to let you sully <laughs> my victory. Um, you know what the funny thing is? I live, um, I'm going to see if I can find this. I'm not totally sure that I can. But Ann and I uh, live on a golf course. Hold on a second. Uh, see if I can find this. I'm not sure I'll be able to. But Ann and I live on a golf course. So actually, I'll steal this picture here and bring it over if I can do that. So right in our backyard, right, that we sit about 20, 30 feet elevated over uh, a golf course. That's, that's hole one is behind us, right? We live right there. So when Ann and I moved into this place, we were like, um, we, we're going to take up golfing. We're going to take up golfing. I've always wanted to golf, not because I love the sport of golf, but because it's what all the guys do, right? Guys go and play golf together I on know. a Sunday, right? And, I, and I've, I've always had friends that go golf and stuff like that together. And I... I just don't golf. And we've always said, we've lived in this house for almost two years now. And we've always said, we're going to just walk over. It's right here. It's a, it's there. It's right here. We just got to walk down the street and we go in and golf and we have still not done it. And I, I'm still committed to giving it a try. I've got to give it a shot because cool people golf and I just don't golf. All right. What's next? We got Jet Stanley Steele who writes these. Oh, those recliner seats with the tables on them that Cinemark has are really the best seats I've sat in. John, do you have a favorite room for a theater in general that you love to go to because of the comfort? I've only been to this one theater twice, 
It's in Pasadena, and it's called, it's a part of a chain called IPIX. I P I C S, IPIX. And their chairs were already full layout sofas that you lay out on. And they have walls around you. Because it's it's room for two. And they have like a wall around you where they have a place you can put your cell phone, got a little charger in there. They bring a blanket for you and all this kind of stuff. It is a tremendous well, Jonathan, it's not too far from where you live. Have you ever been to one of those IPIX yeah. theaters? Yeah. They're great. Mm -hmm. They are I luxurious. would say that's my, yeah, outside of like an A-list, which is like great seats, those are the best seats at IPIC, for sure. Yeah, yeah and, absolutely. And, and the theaters are small, too. Mm -hmm. So it's only like maybe, uh, I want to say like eight rows in the center and then just two seats on the sides, you know, like as you go. So it's just like nice and quiet. It's, it's an great. intimate, yeah. but still enough that if you're watching a comedy, you get that group laughing together. It's it's a wonderful, wonderful movie-going experience. Now, don't get me wrong. If I'm going to see the next Avengers movie or you know the next Superman movie, I want to be in a 500-seat, 700-seat big theater with tons of people. But yeah, that IPIX theater was really, really nice. All right, what's next? Uh, we've got Sam Fisher who writes, Can I just say that I'm loving Kingsley ben as great a uh, graphic in Secret Invasion, and he looks awesome in the Bob Marley trailer. Uh, I also keep getting his name confused with Ben Kingsley. Yellow, I almost did the same when I read that. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. I, I have not loved him as graphic in Secret Invasion yet, mostly because it's he's got like six words at a time. Like there's been no real... He hasn't had a chance to have real character moment yet. Like there was the one scene where he's sitting with the, the scroll council, but even in that, there wasn't a lot of dialogue. So I have a feeling that in the next few episodes, he's going to get that opportunity to have like some true graphic moments, but he hasn't had that yet. And so I, I'm, I'm not going to say I've been thrilled with his performance yet, but that's only because he hasn't really been given a chance to really show what he can do in it. So we'll see. All right. What's next? Okay. Uh, Clifford Lawrence says, John, what is your worst movie theater experience that didn't have to do with the movie itself? Uh, for me, it happened when I saw Birds of Prey opening night, and this guy who was by himself in the front row was watching porn the entire movie. I would have called. I would have made. Had the okay, cops see, get him. here's the thing, Clifford. At that, at that point, okay, I say this as your fellow film loving brother. That's your own fault. Yeah. When if some is doing that, you you got to understand they're not just ruining your movie going experience; they're ru ruining everybody else's. And while I totally adhere to the life motto of snitches get stitches, sure, but but that person's ruining everybody's experience. People paid to be in that theater. If nobody in that theater got up to go inform people that, hey, somebody's in there is ruining the movie going experience for everybody, then that's on you. I mean, when he first pulls it out in his distraction, that's on him. Nobody says anything, just lets them do it. Uh, that's on everybody else in the theater yeah. at that point. For me, again, I've told the story before. I won't go into it in depth, but it was the Jim Carrey movie, the number 23, mm -hmm. when we had like this gaggle of like five or six teenage girls behind us that would not shut the fuck up mm -hmm. the whole time. And uh, that was my worst one ever. But all right, what's next? Uh, Jersey Mor Morlo. Yo, Jonathan, you, you use a product for that sexy mustache you got there. No. This is all natty, baby. <laughs> all, natty. This is all natty. No, I just tr give it a trim once in a while, but no special, you know. This isn't like a, I'm on the mean streets of Tombstone in 1886 and I've got a huge mustache <laughs> that I've got to like. Although groom. I would like to see you try to pull that off. He oh, can. Man. I bet you yeah, can. Yeah, I, I bet I let you it could. Go and I go, I went wider out here. Yeah, I could grow Get the that. full handlebars going too. I'll tell you what, you want to know why I don't have your mustache? Huh? Because I can't grow facial hair. Well, that's I remember the first step. back and when we were still That's AMC. The only step. What are you talking about? <laughs> when I was back That's at AMC, step. I tried to do the I I participated in the No Shave November, right? And I was like 28 days into No Shave November. And, like, and somebody's like, why are you restarting? I'm not restarting. I literally haven't shaved in 28 days. And yeah, I would have scruff, but I would have scruff that a normal guy would have after like three days. And for me, I was on like day 28. So, yeah, there it is. All right, what's next? <laughs> All right, Baby Tacos Films writes, uh, Hey crew, my friends uh, and I are making a movie that's a comedy post-apocalypse movie uh, called Filthy Planet. Um, we finished filming and are editing now and can describe this movie to be a Wally -E meets Step Brothers type feel of it. So excited. 
That's hey, listen, cool. I always tell all film fans, all film fans should make a movie. The great film instructor, Dove S.S. Simmons, uh, who Quentin Tarantino recommended, actually. Uh, Dove S.S. Simmons, I went to his, his program, and he made he opened the program with a great statement. He goes, there's no magic to making a movie. You want to make a movie? Here's how you make a movie. Take a camera, point it at some friends, say action, 90 minutes later, say cut, and stop recording, and you've made a movie. I mean, now, while that sounds ridiculous, there is a truth in that, right? And I think the reason I love other film fans just making their own movies is because it gives you a much deeper appreciation of the movies you watch, right? I mean, I never thought making movies was easy. I never thought making a good movie was easy. But after I made my first movie, it was like, I, it's almost impossible to make a good movie. And I really learned that, and it really deepened my appreciation for what filmmakers do. So I'm glad you're doing that. All right, what's next? Killing Eve fan. Dial of Destiny was all right. Tired of the politics with some movie reviewers and hate of uh, P.W. Bridges. If people have problems with her, Henry Ford, or Henry Ford, Harrison Ford wanted her in the movie, and she never wrote her script. Uh, think she will be great at producing Laura Croft, a.k.a. Killing Eve. Oh, she's fantastic. But yeah, they they wrote the character as an asshole. But here's the problem. Her character was no worse than Shia LaBeouf's character in uh, yeah. in, in Crystal Skull. But nobody had a problem with that because he wasn't a woman. And, and look, let's just call it what it is. Like, I have some major problems with this movie. One of the problems I have with the movie is that uh, Phoebe's character was an asshole. I liked her, though. I know you did. But and I and I've, I've, I've been told by some other people that they liked her too. I found the character to be an asshole and completely unlikable. I also didn't like Shia LaBeouf's character. But there are some people out there who simply will say one is okay and one isn't because one's a woman. I mean, that, that's just the reality. Not me. I just I just thought the character was an asshole. I didn't like her character or, or uh, <laughs> Shia LaBeouf's character. But there are some who just decided before they even saw the movie that... Phoebe Waller-Bridge is a woman in a movie. That must be bad. And it's just unfortunate there are people like that. You, you learn to just tune those people out. All right, what's next? Paul Dean writes, have you, or hey, John, have you listened to any of the Supernatural uh, Then and Now podcast? It's hosted by the guys who play Chuck and Gabriel. And the interview guests and uh, talk, Oh, they, I think it, he means they interview guests and talk about each episode of the series. Uh, they're currently on season four. Thanks for all you do. No, um, I have not. I don't generally listen to, like, I've never listened to, never really, I've listened to bits of it, but never really listened to Office Ladies, which looks great. I've never listened to uh, New Girl, has some of the cast of New Girl that do a episode by episode podcast. Uh, Tom Welling and, and Michael Rosenbaum do a Smallville one i i've never really listened to those um they've just never really appealed to me now here's the funny thing the guy who the guys who played chuck and gabriel they were also one of the flagship shows they were like in in a way they were partners of mine in that they were hired they had a show on lionsgate's comic con hq you remember guys remember that mm -hmm. Uh, there was a network, there was a streaming network called Comic-Con HQ. And the first show that launched the network was my show. They, they Lionsgate had hired me to do this show called Film HQ, and we did that. And a little while later, they launched another show that those two guys did, playing themselves. And they are two guys who were in Supernatural, and it's about them doing the, the uh, fan circuit. The fan convention circuit, right? It wasn't a documentary. It was scripted. It was totally scripted and it was very funny and all that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, you know, Comic-Con HQ did not survive because they made some pretty bad decisions running the place. But uh, that was the, Mark Hamill was one of the other guys who had a show. Mark Hamill did an entire show about collections and people who collected, whether it was action figures or comics or shoes or vintage cars or whatever. Mark Hamill would go around and do you know, somebody who had some really impressive collection. They had a couple of really interesting show ideas for Comic-Con HQ. They just, they launched it before they were ready, I think. And uh, those guys were a part of it. All right, what's next? Okay, I think we're moving over to Supers now. We've got Chris Miner who writes, out of the Harrison Ford character returns within the past decade, what has been your favorite? Han Solo, Indiana Jones, or Rick Deckard in Blade Runner 2049? Han Solo, because I love The Force Awakens. Mm -hmm. I think The Force Awakens was a great movie. Um, and I loved him in it. 
I really loved, uh, I really, really like Blade Runner 2049, but I do not like, I'm one of the very, very few film fans in the world that did not like the original Blade Runner. And I wish I could lie to you. It's very tempting to lie to you to say I do because I know everybody loves Blade Runner and I know all the cool people love Blade Runner and <laughs> I should love Blade Runner, but I have to, I'm always honest with you guys, I didn't. And so since I never really liked the original Blade Runner, it, it, I had no emotional hook for Harrison Ford coming back in the role, even though I ended up very much liking Blade Runner 2049. And, uh, you know, I like Indiana Jones in the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, or uh, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. I like Indiana Jones in the Dial of Destiny, but I also had a lot of problems with it. <clears throat> but I love The Force Awakens. I love that movie. And so uh, I'm going to have to go as Han Solo. All right, what's next? Okay, we've got Orange Han who writes, uh, it's interesting how both Elder Scrolls V and the fifth song of Ice and Fire came out in 2011. 12 years later, we have no idea when the sixth will release. Well, but the I, Elder yeah. Scrolls, I mean, they've put a lot of effort into, they've got like their own World of Warcraft kind of game. Like they got Elder Scrolls online, if I'm remembering correctly. I've yeah, never yeah, played they do. it. I don't like they it as much. Online. I like the standalone games better, but. Yeah, I never tried the online thing. Mm -hmm. Now, I started playing Elder Scrolls with, I believe it was their second game called Daggerfall. Daggerfall. Yeah. I, that was the first real open world game I had played. Mm -hmm. Like to me, it was insane that I could start running across a field and I could keep running for four hours till I get to the next city or something like that, right? <laughs> it, I, I was obsessed with Daggerfall. And that's where I learned and this is a thing you can take. If you ever lost in a dungeon, stay to the left wall and keep going. Eventually, you'll find your way out. Stick to the left wall. And even if it takes you in a roundabout way, eventually you will find your way out if you just stick to the left wall. Um, learn that there. Morrowind. Uh, what was the big one that everybody Skyrim. played? Skyrim. Skyrim. Yeah. Then there was Oblivion, too. Well, Oblivion, Oblivion, and then yep. it was Morrowind, Oblivion, Skyrim. Do you know I never... Okay. I started playing Skyrim. Yeah. And I think what happened was, I think, Ray, you were playing Skyrim too. Mm -hmm. And I think lightning hit the house and it fried the computer it was oh, playing on. Oh, man. And I never played it again after that. My, my Skyrim changed for me when I realized there was a mod to get Master Chief's gravity, oh, yeah, gravity yeah. hammer mods. and his armor. And I started playing that thing. I mean, it was Master Chief on a horse. Yeah. But <laughs> that gravity hammer, yeah. when going to go into a town and you did that thing, the, it, everyone yeah. would fly in the air. And I was like, this is the way gaming should be. Where Master anything Chief goes on a horse. No, just the, yeah. seeing the townspeople go up in the air, like you're literally smashing the hammer to the ground and you see the people in the next town just fly in the air or something. It's crazy. <laughs> I remember the first time I ever saw skins on a game yeah i was playing um oh what's the first person shooter unreal i was playing unreal tournament so this is going back a bunch of years unreal tournament um still my favorite uh oh my shooter God, game unreal i forgot about that game yeah i it mean that, that's what the unreal engine yeah. is right kind of, right mm -hmm. so playing unreal tournament and that was the first time i saw people put like customized skins on characters. I remember the first time I was playing and I saw a dude running around that looked like Homer Simpson. I'm like, that wait a minute, the, how? The game. <laughs> how, how did they do this? How? And it was like opened up a world of possibilities I, to me. I hope you messaged him and he said, I don't know how to do it. And you no. just kept messaging him. <laughs> how? All right, what's next? Uh, Miguel Zayan writes over under 40%. The authority comes out in 2025 months after soups any guesses on how many dc content every year we were uh, we are gonna get batman amazonians then waller or gl series in 2026 thanks y'all are great i really don't um i one of the things that i hope they don't do is get too far ahead of themselves too quickly they got a bunch of stuff planned don't try to rush a whole bunch of stuff out though like get superman out i don't know when they're aiming for brave and the bold the, yeah. the Batman one. I, I hope they don't aim to do anything more than four a year. Now, four may sound like a lot, but by four, because remember, all the stuff they announced is a mixture between television and movies. By four, I mean two TV things, two movies. I hope they start with that type of a pace and kind of take their time a little bit with it. 
And uh, otherwise, they could find themselves a little bit behind an eight ball. So I hope they don't try to cram it all out too fast. All right, guys, listen, we still got more to cover. But before we do, we're going to take just a minute here and thank the sponsors of today's episode, the delicious providing folks over at HelloFresh and my mobile service provider, Mint Mobile. Guys, we want to take a second to thank the sponsor of this video, HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. And that's why it's America's number one meal kit. And HelloFresh gets that you want options when it comes to what you make for dinner, not just the same old thing all the time. And that's why they offer 40 recipes to choose from every single week. So you'll never get bored and can always find something new to try and love. And when you need dinner fast, don't just call for delivery. Think of HelloFresh. Their fast and fresh recipes are ready in just 15 minutes or less. Plus, HelloFresh is 25% cheaper than takeout. Anne and I are both working professionals. And so whenever it comes to dinner time, we're always struggling with whether we should get takeout. But with HelloFresh, it makes preparing dinner together fun, easy, delicious, and nutritious. We absolutely can't live without it. So guys, right now, go to HelloFresh.com slash Campia50. That's Campia50. And use the promo code Campia50 for 50% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash Campia50 for 50% off plus free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. We want to thank a sponsor of this video, Mint Mobile. From the gas pump to the grocery store, your utility bills and favorite streaming services, inflation is everywhere. Seriously, make it stop. Thankfully, there's one company out there that's giving you a much needed break. It's Mint Mobile. As the first company to sell premium wireless service online only, Mint Mobile lets you order from home and save a ton with phone plans starting at just $15 a month. You guys know that ever since I switched to Mint Mobile, I've been saving almost 70% a month over my old phone plan. For people looking Looking for extra savings this year? Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just $15 a month. By going online only and eliminating the traditional cost of retail, Mint Mobile passes the significant savings on to you. All of their plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just $15 a month. Month. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash campia. That's mintmobile.com slash campia. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash campia. And thank you to our friends at HelloFresh and Mint Mobile for sponsoring this episode. All right, guys, let's get through the rest of your questions here, shall we? Jonathan, what we got up next? Justin D. writes, sadly, Joyride wasn't all that funny to me. I only heard a couple of chuckles in my theater. I wish I loved it like y'all did. Good story, though. I, listen, that's the thing. Like, we've heard from a bunch of people today writing in that they absolutely love Joyride. But one of, every time I talk about it, I end talking about it by saying, guys, humor is the most subjective thing. So your mileage may vary. Our theater that we saw it in last night, was losing it. Like the whole theater was absolutely losing it. But it, any comedy is not going to be, I know people who don't like the hangover. Not that there's anything wrong with them. It's just that humor hits us all in different ways. So it's unfortunate that you didn't have as good of an experience as I did uh, or the other people have written in here today. But hey, that's, that's the nature of movies, man. That's the beautiful thing about the art. All right, what's next? All right. Uh, John Redcorn writes, I'm not surprised that Indy 5 is failing. Nobody under 35 cares about Indiana Jones, especially an 80-year-old Indy. And unlike Top Gun, they didn't do a do good job appealing to a younger demographic in marketing. I I am honestly going to I've brought this up before, but I really stand by this. Prior to the Cannes Film Festival, there was a lot of big positive energy and buzz going around Indiana Jones. And once the Cannes Film Festival hit, you could feel feel all the momentum, all the wind, all the energy, all the buzz got sapped away. It was gone. And we talked, we talked a lot after the Cannes Film Festival about now, now it is going to struggle. Now it's going to struggle. Um, I will agree with you though, on the notion that they didn't do a good job marketing the film to a new generation. They really did lean their marketing on nostalgia. And there is a place for that, I think, right? I think there should be a place in their marketing plan 
for a big nostalgia appeal, but they had to have something else as well. Like they had to make trailers, at least one or two trailers or TV spots that was not for people who have already seen all the Indiana Jones films. And on that level, I completely agree. They, it, they needed a nuanced and a varied marketing campaign, and they didn't have it. They took a marketing campaign that was strictly targeted to everybody who's already a fan of Indiana Jones, and they weren't able to pivot or compensate for the fact that they had a lot of negative energy coming out of the Cannes Film Festival, which they were not counting on. And they didn't just didn't have an ability to pivot with their marketing campaign. I think that is part of it. Uh, that's certainly not the main culprit, but that is definitely part of it. You're right. All right, what's next? Okay, we've got uh, Real Life Entertainment who writes, um, two of my favorite movies are Baby Driver and Whiplash. Do you have any films that are, are similar? Thanks, bring on the filthiest of the filth. I love Baby Driver. I like Whiplash a lot. Is that the skating yeah. one? Not the rollerblade. Oh, that's, no, or is that the no. drumming one? No, Whiplash is the drumming one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's one that J.K. Simmons won his uh, oh, right, right, right. Uh, Academy Award for with uh, Miles, uh, Teller. Miles Teller uh, in that brilliant, brilliant, brilliant film. Uh, Baby Driver, so great. Love that movie. I like those movies. Well, particularly Baby Driver and Whiplash are two very different movies. Um, I, I can't really think of one off the top of my head that's really a lot like whiplash off the top of my head baby driver is a less extreme version of some classic guy Ritchie films if you have not seen rock and Rolla or my personal favorite snatch um lock stock and two smoking barrels i i think if you really like baby driver i think you would love those guy Ritchie films so i would suggest checking those out all right what's next Fangblaze 71 writes, I've been loving Secret Invasion and parts of Nick and Talos are so good. Uh, they have great chemistry together. I'll tell you, I've really enjoyed the show so far. Like, I'm not in love with it yet, but I've really enjoyed it. To me, it is the third best um, MCU show on Disney+. Plus. Obviously behind WandaVision, which I still think is their gold standard. Uh, Ms. Marvel, I think, is the second best. Now I think Secret Invasion. I I'm liking it more than... Certainly more than Hawkeye, certainly more than She-Hulk, a little bit more than Falcon the Winter Soldier, which I didn't mind Falcon the Winter Soldier, more than Loki. More, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. The question is, can they finish strong? Because almost all of the MCU shows start strong, but a number of them have a real hard time bringing it home in the last number of episodes. And will this be the next one of that? Don't know. But so far, I'm with you. I really enjoy it. And you're right. I agree. The best parts of the show so far is just the scenes of Talos and uh, Fury just talking to each other. I, I'm, I'm actually eating those scenes up. I'm loving it. To me, that's the strength of it. So let's see how they finish it off. All right. What's next? John Redcorn writes, is anyone excited about Haunted Mansion? I don't sense any interest in it. And the trailers were okay. I hope I'm wrong, but I smell another Disney flop. It's going to flop. I don't know why they're releasing it in summer. It seems like it would be an October movie. It seems like it would be, or and Christmas. I'm not even sure that would help it a lot. But I will say this. I am more interested in it today than I was a couple of months ago. Like, I've, I'm actually feeling that they're doing a not bad job with their marketing because I am getting interested in it. But I don't sense any excitement from anybody about it. Um, it's always funny too, because when the trailer plays in the theater, the trailer seems to get a good reaction from the audience, but I still don't feel any excitement for it from people. So I, I, I suspect it could be one of these movies that maybe actually ends up to be pretty good, but doesn't do well financially. Look, I, when they announced, you guys remember when they announced that they were doing another Hunt and Mansion movie, I thought that was a dumb idea. I, I, I never once heard anybody say, you know what they really need? Another Haunted Mansion movie. That's what they should do. I've never heard anybody say that. It was, I think it was a mistake to make this movie. But I'm actually feeling like it's looking pretty good, but it will flop. Yeah, it'll flop. I just hope it's good when I watch it. All right, what's next? The Everything Entertainment Network says, I feel like Joyride is going to have a soft opening, but such strong word of mouth isn't, or of mouth, it's going to be a constant top five the rest of the summer. I don't know about the rest. I, I wish I shared your enthusiasm, but I do not. Yeah. Uh, I don't think anybody's going to go see this movie. Lionsgate has had very, they've put very little money towards promoting this film. Um, I have seen very, very little marketing for it, like at all. And 
it's it's a low budget raunchy comedy which already kind of narrows down your potential demographic for people going to see it um so as much as i think this is the best i think this is the best comedy i've seen in a decade i said that today earlier today on the podcast um i i think joyride is the best comedy of the last decade but i still don't think anybody's going to go see it and, and you know what? It doesn't even need many people to see it. This is a really low budget movie, <laughs> right? So if this movie can pull off a hundred million dollars, I think they're okay. But that's that that's the barometer here. The barometer isn't four hundred million dollars because this movie ain't going to make that. I think if they can make a hundred million dollars, they'll be happy. But yeah, it's it's just unfortunate. It's just it's a already narrow demographic. It's a raunchy R rated comedy. Um, it's all Asian cast. It's it's very, it's low budget. It hasn't had a lot of marketing. It's just a lot of things working. Any money it makes is going to be from word of mouth. And the word of mouth is strong and it should be strong. I just don't know if that's going to be enough to make it, you know, make 250 million or $300 million. I just don't see it happening. I hope it does. I just know that I see it as a possibility. All right. What's next? King Daddy Goat writes, Super 8 is a guilty pleasure. Have you seen it? I don't think it's a guilty pleasure to me. I mean, I wouldn't be guilty for liking it. I... I wish I liked that movie, but I don't. I like. You that. know what I like the best of it? The best part of it was the uh, student film at the end of it, when he's putting that student film together. See, here's the thing. I remember being at CinemaCon many years ago, before Super 8 came out, and J.J. Abrams came out, and, it, and before the movie came out, and told the story about how Super 8 was actually two different movies. He told the story about how he had this idea for a movie about a kid and his love, like his childhood growing up making movies on the Super 8 mil format and all that kind of stuff, blah, blah, blah. There was another idea for a movie about this monster movie where a train crashes outside of a town and it turns out there was an alien monster on the train and it got loose and blah, blah, blah. These were concepts and pitches for two different movies. And they decided, let's put them together. And when I watched the movie, I could totally feel it. I could feel like this was never conceived of as, as one coherent story or one coherent movie. Mm -hmm. And it didn't work for me. But you know what? That's the beautiful thing about guilty pleasure movies. Guilty pleasure movies are mo shouldn't be movies that, you know what? Everybody kind of likes that. But no, no. A guilty pleasure movie should be a movie that a lot of other people don't like. And you acknowledge why they don't like them, but it works for you. Right? Like a, a good guilty pleasure movie for me is Armageddon. Nobody likes Armageddon. But, and I acknowledge there's a lot of big problems with Armageddon, but I like it. It works for me. Um, cool as Ice. Oh, God. Vanilla Ice is Cool as Ice. That is a horrible movie, man. Horrible movie. But I love it. I love it. So I, I like your choice of, uh, of a guilty pleasure movie. Mm. All right, what's next? Neil before Zimmer writes, Hey, John, do you think the WGA strike is accelerating Gunn's push for DCU uh, video games? Should we expect lots of DCU video games in the near future because story development on movies is on pause? No. Like, listen, in the grand scheme of things, remember, James Gunn is looking at his career as the head of DC over the course of the next 10 years. I mean, at most, this writer strike will last another two months. Yeah. Right. So, so no. I mean, if we we're talking about like a writer strike, oh, this could last two years, then then maybe that would affect his plans. Yeah. On stuff like that, but otherwise, no. I really don't think it's gonna. It's it's going to, uh, it's going to inconvenience a little bit. It's going to cause some a little some shifting here and there, but in the grand scheme of things, at the end of the day, this strike will probably end up being three and a half, four months long. And so, in the grand scheme of things, it's actually not that that huge of a thing that's going to have to make him completely reevaluate his entire strategy. All right. What's next? Uh, right. Also, uh, Malmsten Pee-wee's big adventure is not a guilty pleasure. You, you don't get, <laughs> Oh to no. Feel, most people love yeah, that movie. You don't get, to feel yeah, you can't call that a guilty pleasure. Most people love <laughs> Pee-wee's big adventure. Yeah. Uh, Benjamin Felak writes, hi guys. Love the show. Do you guys each have a favorite video game score? Hmm. Which ones minus kingdom hearts Two? It didn't make a great show on Disney plus. Uh, World of Warcraft. Mm. I, I hear the music for World of Warcraft, and I instantly think of all the different scenes in Azeroth and all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to do anything that's, like, really profound or whatever, but anyone who's played this game, Saints Row 3, that menu music is With the best menu music I've ever heard just because I had that as my ringtone. <laughs> it was it's, – it's a simple thing that probably someone did on the piano or, like, a little – recorder uh yeah. computer thing but the the loopiness to it i could what, listen was, to it forever was and three ever the one where you're like in the 
so, like in the Matrix sort of. It's like software. Like you're... oh, I never played the game. That's uh, the problem. Okay. That's, that's the problem. I never played I the game, four but I was gonna watch someone play it because I wanted to know if I wanted to buy it right. on YouTube. And that person left the because he he was doing it live, so he left the menu on. And, you and just I was like, to the menu. I gotta have this. And I list and I, I just bought that soundtrack off of Amazon Music and not the game. <laughs> you know what else was really good? The the soundtrack to Ghost of Tsushima. Oh yeah, that was actually also really really. That's cool a music. beautiful game. Yeah. like all the way across the board. Yeah. All right. What's next? Uh, Suthius writes, I enjoyed the first episode of Witcher Season 3, but there are a few spots in the big fight scene that of that episode where you can clearly see that uh, Geralt's? Geralt, Geralt's sword doesn't make contact with the other actors. Now, sometimes that happens. I find that to be in almost everything that that has big battle. Like, even in, in the great Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings films, there are moments where you can, ah, they, he didn't actually hit the orc there. Um, that, that happens. I still thought the choreography was good. I just, again... I love The Witcher, but I watched episode one of season three and I was so bored by it that I haven't even bothered watching the next episode yet. I, I, I don't know. You never know how crazy some sharp things are. Like I was I was actually cutting a bagel in half with a really sharp knife and I, it actually slipped through and I swore I missed my finger until I looked at it. Like maybe two seconds later, it just started flowing out of the finger. Yeah, so but, but, but. What, what they're talking about, you could literally see like this much gap between where the oh, sword God. was flying and where the enemy so was. So he must have been knocking like rocks that were in the air into their He eyes. was aiming for ghosts. He's swinging at ghosts. Maybe the wind from his <laughs> But mitts. that stuff doesn't really bother me yeah, all that yeah, much, yeah. to be honest doesn't with really you. I mean, like yeah. even in Godfather, when Sonny's beating the crap out of- uh, Oh, his, the dude in the street. And it's just yeah, like- His brother-in-law. His face is here and it's just like- Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like nowhere I, near. <laughs> I never discount a movie for something like that because- what I end up doing is just laugh, and then it brings me to reality. Hey, yeah. This is not real. And then I get back into the movie again. So. All right. What's next? John Lee writes, um, hey, John, have you watched any of the episodes for Warrior Season 3 yet? Just saw the fourth episode today. I hope they keep on renewing this show. Wow. I have not, because I'm waiting for my wife to catch up on the first two seasons so I can watch Season 3 with her. Ah. However, if she doesn't get on that in the next couple of days, I'm just going to have to bite the bullet and just start watching because I really want to watch season three with her. I've been waiting years for season three, but I mean, she's, listen, my wife is the vice president of this massive national company and, and she's a doctrinal student at USC at the same time. She's busy. I get it, but I just been waiting for it. Have you had a chance to start watching, you know, warrior yet? No, I haven't had a chance. And I just, I just don't know if I can wait much longer. I can't, don't know if I can wait much longer. All right. I think next? if she really took her life serious, she'd get get on this show. That's right. Damn it. Yeah. Get your priorities straight. Yeah, stop honey. screwing around. Dr. Stinky writes, saw, uh, saw you say a Fortnite movie would not work, but it has a story. If you did not know, the story is multiverse related. I'm getting Pizza Hut tonight. Bring on the filthy. Yeah. Get the uh, big New Yorker. Hold on. Hold on. No real story. I will say, <laughs> there's this character in Fortnite that I really love, and he has a burger for a head i don't know what his name is burger his name head is, is probably, his name mayor mccheese his, his name is probably burger head are you sure I don't it's know. not mayor mccheese but mayor McCheese. if i ever see that action figure i'm buying it <laughs> um burger head okay you know what here's the ann and i we've got we got you know, I'll, you know I'm, gonna, I'm gonna throw them under the bus i'm gonna throw them under the bus right now you guys remember if you uh watch the our, our show uh my friend jen was was filling in for us for a few weeks because i needed some help so her and Alex, her guy Alex, right? Um, they came over so we could have a uh, Mario party night. Oh, no, not again. again. Well, no, first, first we went to the Ren Fair together, which was fun. And then we came back to our place to have a Mario party game night, right? And we decided we're going to order some pizza. And we said, do you guys have favorite pizza? And go, oh, we like Domino's. And I'm like, wait, wait, what? What? You like Domino's? Wait. You see, there's piles of horse shit and then there's Domino's, and they're Come pretty on, close man. together. It's there, not that bad, but it's Domino's not your first sucks, right? It's not, but it's not your for anyone's first and, choice. Okay, so but they they love Domino's, so I'm like, I don't know, guys, I don't think I can do Domino's. They're like, when's the last time you had Domino's? I said, you know what? To be fair, it has been a number of years since I've had Domino's, and they were like, we they've made improvements. It's it's better than it was before. <laughs> I'm like, you sure? Because I, I really would. I'm in the mood for some Pizza Hut, man. I freaking love Pizza Hut. Pizza Hut's Meat Lover's Pizza might be my favorite pizza on the planet. Uh, other than 
Chicago style in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. But other than that, for a, for a big chain, Pizza Hut. Love their pizza. Anyway, so I'm like, there are guests. All right, you're right. I haven't tried Domino's in like three or four years. Let's give it a shot, right? I might as well have been chewing on this. It was disgusting. No offense to anybody out there who likes Domino's. But you and I cannot watch a football game together and order food together because that pizza is garbage. Ray, you like? Do you like Domino's? I, you know what? I have these neighbors. They always order a bunch. They're my Armenian friends. They always over order. I'm eating it. It tastes way better when it's free. Well, yes, free food is always the taste. Way better when it's free. It's actually (laughs) when it's free. But (laughs) this dude. I actually might backtrack on the Fortnite thing because I was watching a couple of things and I was like, this could look cool if they did it in a Fortnite T way. But in, but the other half says it might be too late. And I'm, I agree with you. I'm about to put in an order for Pizza Hut so I could pick it up on the way home. <laughs> Big go. New Yorker, dude. Like large pizza, six slices. That's how big the slices are. All right, what's next? Hmm. Okay, Caleb Jacobs writes, why do you think Walker Independence was canceled? I never knew about it. It's a CW I don't even know show. what Walker Independence is. Yeah, that's, so. that's your answer. Yeah, <laughs> none of us knew what it was. That's it was on CW, good apparently. Only but, know all right, Walker. what's next? <laughs> Texas Ranger. Yeah, Texas right. Ranger. Purple baby. Haze writes, John, so I understand the actor is there to serve the character, but I can totally see Glenn Powell play a version of Hal Jordan, Green Lantern, or The Flash. Your thoughts? I mean, sure, but... No. The reason I say no, don't get, me, don't get me wrong. Glenn is a good actor, and so I'm down for him playing any role. But see, you're down for seeing him play Green Lantern. Okay, great. What Green Lantern? Right? What Green Lantern? Green Lantern could be a thousand different ways. I, again, I, I bring this up. You say Joker. Okay, but the Joker that Jack played was a totally different Joker than the one Jared played. And the Joker Heath played was a completely different kind of Joker than the one Joaquin played. So you can say, oh, this person would be great as Green Lantern. What Green Lantern? It it all depends on how... See, here's the thing. When people say, I want this actor to play this role, they've got the the role in their head, the way they want that role to be. But that role could end up being a thousand other different ways, in which case that actor may not be the good fit for it at all. As much as I love Joaquin Phoenix's Joker, right... I don't think he would have been very good playing Jared Leto's Joker. I don't think he would have been a good fit to play the Joker that they had in Suicide Squad. As great as Heath was as Joker, won an Academy Award for it, I don't think he would have been a good fit to play Joker in Michael Keaton's Batman, the one that Jack played. I don't think he would have been a good fit for that because even though they're the same name, they're completely different characters. So that's why when people ask me X actor and X role questions, I always say all that matters to me is are you getting a good actor? Because unless I've read the script, I don't know what this iteration of this character is supposed to be like. So you can't say this person would be a good fit or this person. Like, you just can't say that Glenn Powell would be a good fit to play Green Lantern when you have no idea what that Green Lantern is going to be like. So that's why I always say, forget X actor and X role. Are they a good actor? Glenn's a good actor, so I would I be I love Glenn Powell, him. man. He's made for He's Johnny good. Cage. He's made for Johnny Cage, though. I'll it all depends on how they yeah, write Johnny, Johnny Cage. Because right. there's a thousand Johnny Cages. Right. It all depends on how they write Johnny Cage. He might be terrible for it, depending on how they write him. So it all depends. He's good for the Johnny Cage you've got in your head. Okay, yeah. That, yeah. That, that's go. a fair thing to say, right? All right, what's next? Samir writes, uh, I may have joined the Ray Club and slept for 30 minutes in Indy 5. Uh, we'll go try again next week. Maybe it wasn't the best idea to go watch it after a five-hour flight. Oh, probably, probably not. not, no. And it, listen, one of the problems with that movie... Is it the Ray Club? It's too long. <laughs> yeah. I haven't slept in a movie in like five movies, you, you, bro. <laughs> you have not fallen asleep in a movie yeah, in a long time. I'm on my game right now. I it, the, One of the problems of Dial of Destiny, and there are several, one of the problems is that movie was too long for what it was. It was too long for what it was. That movie could have really benefited a lot if they had sliced about 15 full minutes out of it. I think it would have benefited a great deal from that. And yeah, you're right. After a five hour flight, that's that even the best of movies after a five hour flight is a tall order. All right. What's next? Did you hear that? uh, Twitter sent a cease and desist letter to meta. Good luck. (laughs) Right now. 
Yeah. I, I, I've heard Meta has some money and a whole army of lawyers. So I think uh, they they probably got those bases covered already. Ooh, this is going to juicy. Uh, Rick Bizarre, Ricky Bizarro writes, one of two. Last week I saw a play on Broadway called The Sign of Sidney uh, Brustein's Window. That's a long title because it starred Oscar Isaac. Oh, nice. I found out the day before that none other than Lois Lane, bras in hand, was the female lead. That's wow. great. Um, they were both incredible, and it was an experience I will never forget. Uh, got Oscar's autograph, too. Cool. Oh, that's awesome. L listen, you want to. This was the reason I got so excited when. Oh, what the hell is it? The guy who played Cyborg, um, uh, Ray, Ray Fisher. Fisher. Ray Fisher. This is why I got so excited when I heard that Ray Fisher was going to be playing Cyborg. Nobody had heard of Ray Fisher. I had not seen Ray Fisher in anything. All I needed to know that he was coming from Broadway. You want to separate the men from the boys? Actors who can do stage. Actors who can do stage, nine times out of ten, those are the better actors. I'm not saying only do stage, but I'm saying when you got actors, because when you're acting on stage, you actually are live in person and you got to draw people in with your performance right there on stage, not with the camera angle, not with ADR dialogue, not whatever. It's you on stage and you got to sell that audience who's watching you with their pure eyeballs. And sometimes twice a day. It's, and so, sometimes twice. And maybe every once in a while you let an understudy come in. Yeah. But those are your great actors the ones who can also do stage that's bob odenkirk does stage you know guys like that that's great so when you get people like oscar isaac rachel brosnahan who's our new lois lane i mean that's those are the people that i really get excited about so it, that's pretty cool that you were able to get his uh his autograph daniel radcliffe is going back to broadway too in a yes, uh, he is steven sondheim musical merrily we roll along all yeah. right yeah He's so. been doing a bunch of stage, mm -hmm. Daniel Radcliffe, the last number of years. Uh, right. And then uh, Rachel Knight online writes, uh, which are better of the two, Dodgeball, Happy Gilmore, Wedding Crashers, The Hangover? I would go um, The Hangover and Dodgeball, but I love Wedding Crashers. I also love Wedding Crashers, but I'll go with your two picks as well. Um, uh, uh, hangover and uh, Dodgeball. Mm. There, there's just something about dodgeball, man, that just kills me every single I've time. I've only seen dodgeball, so I'll say dodgeball. I love all those movies, by the way. Love them all, but yeah, that's what I would pick out of the if, out of those pairings. <laughs> all right, what's next? All right, finally up, Eric D. Simply says, "Love you guys." Oh, thank you so Aww. much, Eric D. And Eric guys, D. that'll do it. <laughs> Loves us for today's installment of Why you love us? Mike. <laughs> thank you so much for being here and making this little show part of your day. Big special thank you to all you guys who sent in those. <laughs> tip questions and those super chats number one because you gave us interesting fun things to talk about but number two you supported our channel as you did it and all of us involved here thank you guys so very much for your support hey guys don't forget open mic is also available as a podcast on our john campia show podcast feed as well as the john campia show is on the john campia show podcast feed make sure you guys have gone and subscribed to our podcast that is the best way to consume the john campia show we actually make the john campia show now primarily as a podcast yeah we throw up a video version of it but we really make it with the audio podcast experience in mind go find it on apple Podcasts, spotify or your favorite podcasting app of choice guys make sure you come back and join us again tomorrow so for Ray Aura, yeah. Jonathan Voico, See ya. my name's John Campia, and until next time, my brethren, <laughs> bye bye. <Eric. laughs>